and welcome to episode five of the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. Coming up, the rocket goes back to school for a special snooker lesson. Why not? I think you've had That's enough time on that. He gets the chance to grill his all-time snooker hero. If there's any way I can possibly enjoy it, it's by not putting myself under any pressure whatsoever. Plus, there's a more advanced instalment of Ronnie's Masterclass. Today I'm in Passmore's Academy in Essex. Stu Davis has brought his functional snooker into schools. I don't know much about it, but we're going to go and find out a bit more. So come, let's go and see what they've got. As snooker continues to grow across Europe and in China, back in the UK, participation in the sport has seen a fall. When the chance came to redress the balance, one snooker legend grabbed it with both hands. Steve, we've come here today at uh, school in Harlow. We've got this new game here called Functional Snooker. Um, can you tell me a bit, a bit, a bit about it? What is... well, yes, well, the Functional Snooker is the byproduct of, of Q zoning to schools, really. Mm. Um, and we realised that possibly kids weren't watching what their parents watched. Going back to the 80s, when everybody watched snooker, and then perhaps the kid said to his father, I'd like to go to the snooker club. That's not happening. We thought, well, if kids are not coming to snooker clubs, perhaps we take the snooker club to the schools. Well, I'm, I'm interested to know how this functional snooker works now. Well, I could show you how to play functional snooker, but I know a couple of other people that I think would be probably better at showing you. And who's that? A couple of like, young kids from the school. Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah, let's go have a look. OK, so... This is functional snooker. We need a scoreboard, and obviously there's a calculator there as well. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you into uh, Falsal Snooker by introducing Charlie and Chloe, who are going to be your mentors. OK. Over there. I'm going to be the scorer. Can you show me how to play then, yeah? Yes. So I know what normal snooker is. I, just, I don't know what Falsal Snooker is. There's numbers on balls. What's, yeah. this, what's this about? If you pop, say, the number seven, you'll get seven points. Right. For the value of the red ball you popped. Right. And then, say, if you went for the black, you'd get seven points for the red, and then you times your score for the red by seven, and you get 49 shots scored. If you pop the pink ball, your opponent loses six points. Oh, my opponent loses yeah, six points? Yes, so your opponent loses oh, okay. six points. Right. The rules right. of the game are exactly the same as normal snooker. It's just the scoring is different. The scoring's different. Yeah, you want to have a go? Right, come on. Right, I'm going to pop this one here. Four. Yes, that's four points. Right, I've got four. Go for, uh, right, so I'm going to go four, minus five. Well, I'm going to pot this red. Yeah, look. Yeah, but what's that? How many was that? One. One? Oh, that's terrible. One times seven. That's, I've wasted it, haven't I? This is ridiculous. That's, that's not very good, is it? And then, yeah, one, one times time seven. seven. One so that's seven. seven. Oh. One no. times seven is seven. That's an eleven total score. So now I've got this ready. This is a ten. This is this is like the the, the, the bonus ball in, in so effect. Yeah. yeah. If you're gonna be clever. You should probably go for the ten. Then go yeah. For the then go for the black, and you get seventy points. And if you were losing by a long distance, you could then all of a sudden end up in the lead. Get it back in one shot. Yeah. That's the difference. I like that. Functional snooker. You can easily jump into the lead. It's always making you think yeah. about numbers, points, possibilities. If you're 70 behind, but there's a 10 on the table, you're thinking, I can get back, back yeah, into it. Yeah, you could be tied. Yeah, so that's 56 points. Mark in the middle. 67 minus yeah. 5. I like this game. I think this is better than snooker. I've got to be honest with you. It's really I'm serious. Snooker's boring. This it's is more exciting. Right. Oh, wow. I'm lucky. I want to win this competition. <laughs> <laughs> So that's five points. Five times four, 20, please. Yeah, that's 20 points. Oh, mate, I'm on a bigger now. So they're going to be minus 10. So now I'm going to pop this, seven. And now I'm going to get times seven. Oh, unbelievable! <laughs> this is a great game! You're currently on 146. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you've made a mistake there. What was that red up? Seven times seven. Yeah, he's on he's no, right. You've got it right. Yeah. Now I'm going to make my opponent lose. That's six. That's six. That was six. That's six. And now the pink is going to be a minus six. Oh, oh you're six now. Oh, you're <laughs> now minus one. 
was good. I enjoyed that. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 190. Chloe, minus one. <laughs> I think snooker is really a difficult game, but to play it on this side, it's yeah, more yeah. fun, it's quick, and like you say, with the numbers, it keeps like you can involve children and make fun. I mean, I know if I, if I use this with my daughter and my son, the numbers and the math side of it would make them interested. My daughter doesn't want to play snooker, but she'd definitely want to play it if she, if she thought, oh, that's helping her with her maths. So I, I'm absolutely sold on it. I think it's a great idea. Fun things to involve people in the game. Later on, we're going to be some, doing something called the, the Snooker Relay. You might enjoy that as well. It's your type of game. It's got you written all over it. It's fast, it's furious, it's not slow. That Peter knowing, Ebden wouldn't be able to play this game. knowing it, they're actually making snooker fun again. Trying to. Is this the relay? Yeah, this is the Snooker Relay. So right. You take the first shot, you're the captain. Yeah. Are we all on the same team? Yeah, then you pass the cue to him, he takes the shot. The functional snooker programme was, was designed around something we call cue zone in school. And, you know, one of the things we need to do as a governing body is engage as many young people in our sport as possible. Cue zone in school was, was exactly that idea. It was about getting young people on a snooker table, engaging them, getting them off the streets. And we found the programme to be very successful. The functional snooker part was a game designed by Chris Lovell, our head of coaching and development. He put together a package, he has a training background, which was really about increasing basic arithmetic skills in young children. We know there's a problem with that at the moment in education, and we feel we've got, got some answers towards it. We found lots of young people hadn't got the adequate maths and English skills to get them through life. And uh, we started to work with snooker over 15 years ago because we saw the natural progression of scoring. Uh, but with functional snooker, we modified it to ensure that we'd include the addition, subtraction and multiplication situations uh, to the game. And it's proved very successful. The, big, the biggest thing we see is that snooker puts smiles on people's faces. And in this particular school, over 100 children each week are doing maths using functional snooker. Well, that's, that's great for us. Programmes like this will, will allow people to understand the sport from how to play. They'll enjoy it because they're mixing with their friends. We think that's a very important part of, of actually engaging people and keeping them engaged. Still to come on the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show, Ronnie gets a chance for a one-on-one -on -one with the six times world champion, Steve Davis. Steve Davis dominated the sport of snooker in the 1980s, winning the world title six times and was ranked world number one for seven consecutive seasons. Because of this, Davis became a household name and inspired a whole new generation to play the game, none more so than a young Ronnie O'Sullivan. With the kids back in the class, the Rocket got his chance to finally sit down and interview his idol. Steve, thanks for having us down today. I just want to take you back to the snooker because obviously I've been a you was my hero growing up, and I've studied your game. I, you know, ever since I was the age of 10, I've watched you. I was just going through your Wikipedia the other day, and I was looking at some of your results, and I was just like, semi-finals, 9-0. Final, 10-0, 10-1. Really? There was lots of 9-0s and lots of 10-0s and lots of 10-1s in major, major finals. This is against the best players that was around. It was only then that I was like, Phew. I mean, how, why, how can you be that much better and be beating people with that much ease. No disrespect to those players, but I would say the general standard wasn't as high as you may think. When I say these players weren't as good, I'm talking talk about myself as well. We, I don't think the general standard was as high as it is today by any means, and I think it's always improved, it's gone up. But I was obviously head and shoulders, if not a bit higher, at some stages above the rest of the player. Where I was very good was, was being um, constantly on it. So during a match, when I was fighting in, in front, I was even thinking, focusing even harder. So I'd say one of my greatest strengths was the ability to not ease up. And I think that was probably where I was able to, to slaughter people. <laughs> but there wasn't anybody around of 
your level, Stephen Hendry's level, John Higgins' level, to challenge me. Timing's important, and I think I was in the right place at the right time. I know a tournament that's special to you is the UK Championships. I know everybody goes on about the World Championships, but I do remember you having massive success in the UK. Yeah. yeah I remember one particular match that you had, and uh, I can't remember which year it was, but I remember you were playing Stephen Hendry. I was a Steve Davis fan. There was a lot of kids, we were at a junior tournament, a lot of them was Hendry's fan. They were saying, Hendry's going to beat Davis. I was like, no, 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 that Steve's going to win. I remember you went 6 0 down. Did I? Maybe 6 0 down, 6 1 down. I can remember at starting. I thought, oh, it's all over here. But that was when the UK was run over two days. I remember you pegged it back. You was 15 14 in front. I should have won. Stephen Hendry. You should have won. I should have won. He was in front by a lot. He's done a miracle clearance. Yeah, he did a great clearance. Blew down the rails. Oh, it killer. <laughs> Tell me about that match, because obviously Stephen well, Andrews is the new yeah. the one to take over from you, but what was that like playing in that well, match? Stephen Andrews was coming through the ranks. Mm. We all knew how good he was, because mm. he, uh, he, was, he was threatening to be good. But obviously, um, there's a time when there's going to be a... If there's going to be a, a change of guard, if there's going to be a raising of the bar, which I think Stephen Andrews did raise the, the type of snooker, Played as well as you know, relentless stuff as well. Mm. Somewhere down the line is a, there's that crucial match, and that probably would have been the one. Mm. That was the moment when Stephen Hendry took over my mantle, and I then became a worse player because of it, and he became a stronger player. But of course, it wasn't just Stephen Hendry um, that I that was coming up. It was all of the other players behind him, like the Ken Doherty's and the the, the general standard. So I was fighting against the tide trying to hold it back but Stephen Hendry's victory in that match that then became a defining moment and from my perspective was a massive boot in the stomach so in many ways the next question I'd like to ask you what was more disappointing losing the 1985 world final or losing to Stephen Hendry in that final what, what one really kind of hurt you more well looking at how I dealt with the 90s and dealt with the fact that I was no longer the best player in the world, losing to Stephen Hendry was by far the worst because I then had to deal with all of us. At one, at one time in my career, I had all the sweets locked up in my own little sweet jar and next minute they were spilled on the floor and Stephen Hendry had them all. So for most of the 90s, I didn't like him at all. Hated him. Hated the thought of him being better than me didn't even want to acknowledge it existed. So the fact that he, he beat me in that match, looking back, was a big turning point. Um, I think Stephen Henry probably dealt better with you coming along than I did with him coming along, to be quite honest. And the likes of John Higgins as well coming. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Henry was quite, what was quite philosophical about the fact that one day he wouldn't be the best, even though it still hurts. Mm -hmm. But for me, losing to Dennis Taylor was a shock and awful but it was get overable because I probably thought I was better than Dennis. Mm. But Stephen Hendry, all of a sudden, I had massive problems mm. because I thought he was better than me. Not, not so much in all-round play, but he, he played a stronger, more aggressive game that I'd not grown up with, mm. and I didn't know how to teach myself new tricks. So in some ways, did you, did you, at some point in your career, did you think, I need to reinvent myself? Well, I tried to, but I don't think you can. Did well, you try? I, I, yeah, yeah, I tried. I, mean, I used to, I pra you know, practising, trying to... So then, then, to some degree, it's what I'm... A, the problem then for, for long term is you start to say, well, what am I doing wrong that I used to do right? And you know full well that perhaps it's not just about you. It's actually people that are playing to a better standard. But you still beat yourself up on the practice table trying to work out how do, you, how do I get better than I am? And how can you? If you've been playing for 10, 15 years, can you, can you jump up another standard? What do you do? Do you go down the gym? Do you, or, you know, do you practice? Up? What do you practice? I mean, mm. so you try and you are working on technique, thinking, oh, I know, if I change that little finger, if I move that little finger a quarter of an inch, it might help, or... If I sip my water differently, no. If I, you know, whatever I do, you know. So I try things and, and f mm. basically from, from my perspective, I hated the 90s as a player. You talk about the 90s and there's a match I want to kind of talk to you about in the 90s. I think you played, it was in the Masters final, 1997. I think you played me. Oh, that match. Oh, yeah. And um, 
Nice match. Now I get a chance to talk to you yeah, about it. Yeah, gee whiz. Well, I can't remember much about it, actually. I can remember loads about it. Um, well, obviously I remember the streaker. Yeah, I mean, we all remember the streaker. You, you were putting all the balls. And I, I think it's 3-1 in front, 4-1 in front? Oh, uh, in a tour. I was 2-0 up. We go tour. Well, 2 did it. <clears throat> I think she come on at about 2-1. We end up 2 at the interval. We come out, we end up 4 all. Yeah, I know. I yeah. thought like I had a bit of the better of the match. But I do remember coming out for the evening session. You, you must have I never missed well, a ball. You never missed a ball. I went 8 4. And I remember going in at the interval saying to my mate, we're done. It was oh, 150 really? grand winner's wow. prize. I think I had the highest break prize. I was in a bit of a dream now. I think that, you know, and that was the mistake. The next six frames were the worst six frames of my really? life because you never missed a ball. You never left me a shot. Every time I had you in trouble, you put me in trouble. You made a 138, you made a 70, you made an 8, you made a 9. And in the end, I just thought, ah, oh, I'll give up. And I just mentally deteriorated. Not because I was... Um, I was just being out, fought, outplayed, outboxed. And that's when I fought the domination of the 80s and the 90s. And looking at your Wikipedia, I wasn't surprised. I thought, well, I see what he'd done in them six yeah. frames. And I thought, if he was doing that to them week in, week out, I would have give up. <laughs> and there's a story about Doug Mantua. I don't know whether you read it, but I remember it's a kind of bit of a famous story. He booked out of his hotel the day oh, that yes, he was right, playing yeah, him to yeah. save himself. That's how dominant he was. And that was the only time, I think, in my career that I'd played you in that where phase. that was the 80s of Steve. Well, obviously, I, I was able to play good match snooker, you know, hard match snooker. Mm -hmm. I think on occasions in the modern day game, I'd be found wanting for. Um, break, 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 break. I mean, I don't think I've ever... I think once in my career I made three century breaks on the trot. But from, from my perspective, I know what it feels like to have a big lead eaten away at, and you do become vulnerable. So when you're a couple of frames in front in a final, it's no big deal if the guy hits back, because mm. you're only a couple of frames in front. But if you're four frames in front, and as you say, you quite rightly think you're more or less over the line, then, when the person comes back and shows strength, it is very easy to crumble mm. because all of the negatives come into your mind. So I know exactly what it feels like. I was 8-0 up against Dennis Taylor in the world final. Overnight, I was a mess at 9-7 in front. I was 7-1 up against Alex Higgins in the U one of the UK championships. He turned me over. So looking back, obviously, now you've won the senior world championship last year. You kind of you don't, you don't play. It's still nice to win. It's competing. I mean, I watched it. I mean, you still it's get a buzz competing. Three, which is, yeah, yeah uh, I, was, I was solid in that best of three against Nigel Bond. <laughs> <laughs> but do you still get the same buzz? That's no. what I'm trying to say. You don't get the same buzz. No, I don't get the same buzz, no. no. Um, which is to some degree why I've not played in all the, the events this year. I love the game. Is that kind of nice in a way? Yeah, part of it is actually mm. that I, I'm not a slave to having to go to the practice is table. Is that how you feel? To some degree, without even knowing it. So what happened was um, I'm there trying to hang on to my ranking. Enjoying the challenge? Yeah, I think so, but I'm not enjoying losing. Mm. Um, enjoying the exhibitions, enjoying doing the stuff with the kids and everything, but turning up at the matches and going, you know, I'm not really... I don't, I don't know, I, my body doesn't like it as much as it used to. You know, there's so many good players out there and every now and again I'm missing shots and it's terrible. Mm. So, in the end, if I'm not going to do it properly, then perhaps I shouldn't do it at all. But perhaps I'll still turn up for the occasional match. So I think that's my mindset at the moment. If there's any way I can possibly enjoy it, it's by not putting myself under any pressure whatsoever by practising. Steve, it's been great it's to pleasure. talk to you. Thanks for the uh, Cheers, Rob. opportunity. And thanks for having us here today. It's Thank been you. great. Thanks. Stay tuned, as there's more from Ronnie after the break. I'm looking forward to playing tonight. If I lose, could be retirement number 64. <laughs> Catch you later. Seeing as we've had so much interest in the masterclass, we've decided to put another one in. Today we're going to be talking about a certain shot called the soft screw. It's not your deep screw and it's not your kind of little fiddy little shot it's kind of the in-between shot the shot that I like to call the professional shot and today I'm going to be running through this shot here and I'm going to show you how to pot this blue and kind of get on this red but in a professional way everything 
soft screw wire is done from the middle downwards. Anything above is classed as a follow through or a stun run through. So you start from the middle and work your way down. And because it's an in-between shot, it's for you to find out what works best for you. So what I would encourage you to do is to play this shot, keep the red in the same position, the blue in the same position, and play it in a variety of different spaces. So here we are with the blue. I'm getting down to the shot. I'm just below the middle. And I've kind of always accelerated my cue. The cue is going through at that speed on all shots. If it's a deep screw, if it's a soft shot, the only thing we're changing is the pressure on the grip. So for a deep screw, you'll have a tighter grip. For some little run through, you'll have no grip at all. For the in-between shot, you kind of have to have a bit of both. You have to use your fingers just a little bit more. We're now going to show you how to play the stun run through. Again, it's the kind of advanced positional way, it's the professional way of playing the shot. A lot of people think you can only play a stun run through on a straight shot. Well, I'm telling you, you can't. You can play it on an angle shot as well. And what we do on a stun run through is always aim middle and above. Anything middle and above is classed as a run through. But we're going to be doing it in a stun kind of fashion. So we're not going to be hitting it too hard again. The pace of the cue is going to be going through at a certain speed. It's all done in a pressure grip. So here we have the blue, and it's on a straight angle. And I'm going to line up, cue in the middle, maybe a little bit above. But this is going to be called the stun run through. And again, the cue has not gone through very fast, nice and smooth, but I've kept and maintained a nice kind of pressure on my grip. Not too tight, not too loose. And here you can see the white ball's probably travelled through two feet. Another way you can play a stun run through is the off straight shot. You've kind of got the blue here. You want to kind of get your white down here. The natural angle is if you roll it in, is that your white's going to stay here. So you're going to be a, a massive distance away from your next ball. So this shot here, I'm going to show you again by just playing the stun through, no different to how I've played that shot, and how you can widen the angle of a ball. So I'm going to show you now. Again, we start in the middle of the white. Nothing different in the middle, maybe a little bit above, and I'm just going to follow through. And there you can see the white has gone off at that angle instead of going over there. And that is called the stun run through. A lot of people want to know how to bust the balls open, break the pack. Now, this shot was invented by a certain guy called Stephen Hendry. This is more like the modern day shot. We've kind of spoke about the stun run through and the soft screw. For me, this is the kind of in the middle of that type of shot. You don't want to have too much stun run through, but then you want to have too much screw. We're going to try and, try and take the spin out of the white. We're obviously going to need some spin in it, but not too much. We want to make sure that when the white hits the blue, that it travels into the pink or these two reds, and it has a bit of bite in it. So the white will then hit the reds and stay in the middle of the table. With that way, if the white stays in the middle of the table, you've got much more chance of being on a red. If you hit these with too much screw, there's a good chance your white could hit the pink, come back up to the bulk. If you don't get enough, if you get too much stun run through, then your white could end up down the black. So here I'm going to show you how to play the shot. We get down onto the blue, we hit in the middle of the white. And again, I haven't hit it really too hard. There's no need to hit any ball hard. Again, it's all about the pressure of the grip getting good contact on the white, getting a firm striking on the blue, taking the spin out of the white so you don't want too much grip or not enough grip. And as you can see, I've opened the balls up nicely and I'm on a red. Before we go, ever wondered what life is like on tour for the Rocket? The five-time world champion took a camera to China and here's what he came back with. Day one. We uh, are now in Chengdu. As you can see, the lads on tour are a bunch of lazy gits. They just sit around a breakfast table and talk and talk and talk. What a life. There's the soup.
Mm -hmm. Love you too. <laughs> when was it last time you beat me? Twelve years ago, somewhere. Twelve years. Keep trying, son. Huh? Get on that practice table. Oh, okay. uh, you and Mark getting on your practice. Who, who, who gets the better of each other? Twitter lately? Yeah, I, sometimes I get a few little tweets. Yeah. You bashing him up? Yeah. yeah but everyone's bashing him up at the moment, isn't yeah. they? <laughs> I mean, it's not really much of a thing to brag about, is it? <laughs> is it, Mark? Not really. Either. Ten years ago. What were you doing to him ten years ago? Him once a week. Smashing him, weren't you? Probably. Was he smashing you ten years ago? Oh, you're doing him there, though. Twelve years, have you? <laughs> <laughs> We've already gone through that one. I'm looking forward to playing tonight, and uh, I'll let you know how it goes. If I lose, could be retirement number 64. <laughs> Catch you later. I need a chance to play the car. Who's going? You are. Yeah, I'll have, have a cup of tea, an English tea. What about the coffees here? Five pounds, get that on camera. Five, five pounds? Are you serious? For five pounds for a coffee? It's cheaper to get f***ing. <laughs> 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 Thank you for a wonderful day, and it's been great to be sharing all this wonderful, exciting stuff that's going on in China with you all. I hope you're really enjoying it and having fun just as much fun as I am. And, um... <coughs> have a nice day. Speak to you soon. See you tomorrow. Bye. That's it for now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time for more action on and off the base.